And I have been uh, in my mind searching for things in the Word and just uh, finding answers to some things. Um, I was praying the other day, or probably late last week, that the Lord would really give me direction on where my messages are going and what I was going to be doing. And uh, I, I want to do a series on, on Jesus. Well, that series is going to last a long time. long time. Um, it may be the whole year. Um, but I think there is so much when we learn of Jesus. But there's one thing that I've always believed, and that's the Trinity. There's a lot of people today that are fighting that, saying the Trinity is and doesn't exist. And I think to myself, well, what Bible are you reading? Because mine talks about it everywhere. You know, so I, I got to praying about that and seeking that and wanted some clarity just for some things in my mind that I have. So the Lord gave me those. And I want to do a thing on Hebrews. I think that book of Hebrews is one of the greatest books to read. Um, you talk about the supremacy of Jesus, and you see it in the book of Hebrews. It, it doesn't get no more powerful than that. I'm not going to do a verse by verse of Hebrews, but I'm going to do some highlights from it. So I, you know, some different points that leads to Jesus. And I can kind of pick a page because they all do, but but um, but I want to go further than that. But then I got to thinking about that. Before we get to that, we got to have our heart right to even understand it. So this is where I'm going this morning. I'm going to preach on something um, that needs to be said. Things that. Um, lead us to a closer relationship as the songs we sang this morning testify to. So when we talk of sin, it's an interesting thing. Um, it's something that we all got to be convicted about, worried about, because we all live with it. So as we open this message, let's just allow the Holy Spirit to work, move in our own lives, and prepare us. Because if we're not prepared for the message, we'll never receive anything. It, it'll never come across so it's something that we have to come to a place in our life where we know that what I'm learning and what I'm hearing is something that I need. Father, we ask now that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work. Father, give me the words to say. But Father, most of all, allow your Holy Spirit just to do a mighty work to where we can understand what you have for us. And Father, that we can apply it in such a masterful way. So Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus and Father, the work that he does in our lives and the understanding we have through him. So I pray, Father, you'd bless now in a mighty way. In Jesus' name, amen. There was two mischievous little boys. These kids were just terrors across town. Everybody that knew them, these kids were just devil incarnate, basically. They were evil little fellas. But their mom heard about a pastor that had incurred luck with working with troubled kids. One of the boys was eight and one was 11, so she contacted this pastor and asked him if she had talked to the boys. Well, he agreed to talk to him, and he said, I'll take the youngest one first. So he brought the boy in, sat him down, and he looked right at him, eyeball to eyeball, and he said, where is God? Little kid now, he, he, he's pretty petrified by this point. Kid never responded. He just sat there and stared at him. Well, that didn't work for the pastor, so this time he got a little more loud. Where's God? Little kid now, he's, he don't know what to do, so he just flat out sits there. Well, we've all seen that pastor with them long fingers. You know, they just kind of point at you. Well, he threw that old prophetic finger out there, and he put that in his kid's face, and he said, where is God? That little kid, now he's scared to death. Boy, he took off for home. Never said a word. He just started running. Got home. He flew in the house. He flew upstairs, run into the bedroom, and dove in the closet. Well, his other brother wanted to know what's going on because he know he's next. And he come walking into the closet, and he says, man, he says, what is the matter? What happened? He says, dude, he says, God's missing, and they think we did it. <laughs> you know, we laugh at that, and it's funny to hear something like that. But the thing of it is, these two boys were worthy of judgment. They were worthy of judgment. But yet they did not want to realize and come to grips that they did something wrong. They couldn't see it in their own life. Even though they were fully worthy of, of destruction, they couldn't see it. But most are like these boys. We go through life that same way. We know that we're wrong. We know that we, we desire judgment, but yet we don't want to admit we've done anything wrong. We all know right from wrong. And this is what's interesting. They think that they can run from judgment. They think they can do it their own way, and in the reality that they live in, they don't see it. They don't see it. 
They don't see what's coming their way, but they also don't realize the penalty that waits. They don't think they are deserving of penalty. They did, not, they did nothing wrong in their own eyes. But we know that's not true because we have to understand something that's very important. When we come to the place of judgment, there is no place we can run, and there's no closet that we can hide. There's no way we can get away from it. We have to confront the idea that we are guilty and we will be found guilty. And if we come to the idea that we think we can get away with something, we're wrong. We're not going to get away with something. I think the Israelites are the greatest example of this. The Israelites were people that lived for years and years and years with God's blessing on their life, but yet they never accepted it. And they constantly lived in disobedience. Look at this verse, Numbers 32, verse 23. But if ye will not do so, behold, you have sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. You can't hide. You can't hide because at some point, your sin will find you out. It will come to light. But note also Isaiah. Isaiah 59, 12. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. Powerful statement right there because it's telling me one thing. It's telling me that I have to acknowledge my sin as the first process of forgiveness. I have to come to a place where I acknowledge that sin. If we never acknowledge sin in our life, we will never repent from that sin. It's something we will continue with forever, but we have to understand this. This is the first process in forgiveness is realizing that you've done something wrong. Until we've re If we don't realize we've done anything wrong, then we in our mind will never accept the fact that when judgment, judgment comes, I'm worthy of it. Then I, I have a comment. When we confront the legitimacy of our sin, we still think we can get out of it. One second. She's upright. That's a good thing. So when we look at sin, we have to realize that we have to confront it. it it's something that when we can see the, the, uh, the, the legitimacy of that in our lives, it makes all the difference in the world because then we can find the right way. I don't have to be told that I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I know that for a fact. But what we have to realize is there's two types of sinners, and this is what we miss. I am a sinner. I won't deny that, and so are you. We know that that's the first part of sin. But there's also another type sinner, and that's the one that's saved by grace. That's the one that's saved by grace. And because of that, I know that I can stand before God knowing that I can plead the blood of Christ over me and know that I'm healed from that. We can try to attempt a way out, but there's no way to get out of this. If you've ever heard, some of you younger folks may not have ever heard of this guy, but his name was W.C. Fields. Most of us can remember him. But W.C. Fields was in the hospital in the last days of his life, and his friend walked in to see him. And W.C. Fields was sitting there thumbing through a Bible, and his friend walked in and he said, what are you doing? He says, you never read the Bible. You never look at the Bible. What are you looking at that for? He goes, I'm looking for loopholes. <laughs> looking for loopholes. Well, let me tell you something. There is no loopholes. There is no loopholes. Note this verse, Romans 2, verse 2 verses. Therefore thou art an inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that, that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest does the same thing. When we look at this and we begin to see this verse, we have to understand that God through his work is the one that does the judging. It's not us. We are not the judge. The judgment something that we should fear? I don't think so. I don't think we should fear judgment as a Christian. We should not fear it. If we are living in obedience, there should be no fear. But if we are living in disobedience, then we have everything to fear. Because the judgments of God are just, and we will have what's coming to us. And that's what we have to understand. I want to explain this this way. I've been around building all my life, uh, from little projects to big projects. I, I've been around it. But there's an interesting thing that what takes place. Even in your homes, you can relate to this. Have you ever tried to hang wallpaper? Most of us can say yes, and they hate doing it. It's just a pain in the neck. But the thing with wallpaper is this, as much as any other construction project is, 
that you have to start perfect. You have to start right. Because if you start wrong, everything's going to compound behind that, and it's going to be wrong. So if I'm hanging a piece of wallpaper, it has to be straight right from the get-go. So I take my level, I slap it up on the wall, and I draw me a perfectly line. Straight, plumb, is good. I think, man, I got it. I take my wallpaper, man, I match it up to that line perfect. It's perfect. So I sit there, and I take my next one, and I begin to hang it. I paint another one, and by then it's big enough on the wall that I can actually see what I've got. So I step back to admire my work, and what happens? You freak because it's like this. What happened? What happened? I started straight. My level was plumb on that wall. It was straight. But the problem comes when your level was off just a little bit. It was off just a little bit. And that little bubble in there got shifted just enough that it throws your line off. It got dropped. It got installed wrong. Whatever it might be, it's off. And when that comes off, everything then goes bad. Understand something. When we use faulty methods, you get faulty results. Get that. Drive that into your heart. If you use faulty methods, you will get faulty results. And it happens continually. When it comes to our sin, God's interesting because God uses the simplest devices that we can come up with. But yet those simple devices are the most accurate. I want you to read this verse. Um, there's an Old Testament verse, what I think is, is good. Because what happens is that we have to realize that when God judges, he judges, he judges it right. He does it right. He does it exact. And he does it exact every single time. How does he do it? Watch this verse. Uh, I missed that one, but we're going on. Amos chapter five, uh, 7, verse 5. Then said I, O Lord God, cease, I beseech thee. By whom shall Jacob arise? For he is small. The Lord repented for this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord God. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood upon a wall made by a plumb line. And with a plumb line in his hand, the Lord said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then said the Lord, Behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. Man, that's a rough judgment right there. But the question we ask is, what does God use? Amos says God uses a plumb line. Well, what in the world is a plumb line? Glad you ask. I got one right here. It's not mine, but I had to make this because I couldn't find mine. But we're going to make this our plumb line because that's just what it is. A plumb line is nothing more than something hanging just like that with a metal weight at the bottom. And what happens is this plumb line, by the way God made gravity, is the most pre precise instrument you'll ever see because it never changes. It never changes. And this is what God's using to measure man. Why is this important to understand? Why is it important to understand? It's this reason right here. I'm just messing up here right and left, ain't I? Why am I doing this? There it is. All right, I don't know how that happened, but I must hit the wrong button. But anyway, watch this. God desires us to live a life of obedience, to live a life seeking to be as, as the one we will be judged against. It gives us the importance of striving for righteousness. That's what a plumb line does. That's the way God judges so when I see this and understand this, it's an amazing thing. Judge, God judges by righteousness. And for a long time, I searched the word for, for different things. And this is one of them. What is it, the key thing in our lives that we must do? And it's right there. Strive for righteousness. Bottom line, that's what it is. I have to come to a place where my life is so much like Christ that I desire nothing more than righteousness, to walk in that righteousness, to live within it, and to have it control and rule my life. But yet, so many don't want to live that way. Notice 5 again in Amos 7, verse 5. Then said I, Lord Jehovah, cease, I beseech thee. How shall Jacob stand, for he is small? Now we see Amos throwing out excuses. We're just small, Lord. How can this be? If we're so small and you drop that line and you annihilate all of us, what do we have left? What do you have left as your inheritance? 
And this is what he feared. Amos is praying for Jacob. I did some searching on this because there was something in my mind that just wasn't quite laying right. Because sometimes they use Jacob in a different way than they would use Israel or um, um, I, that's the word I was looking for. Sometimes they all judge them different, and, and how they look at the Scripture by that name makes it a little different, but this one doesn't. So apparently what he's saying here is the nation of Israel that is small. Now, what does that tell us? At one time, these people were as the sand of the sea. They were a great and mighty nation, feared nation, but now all of a sudden they're small. That means they've deteriorated. This, to me, is sad. Because what we see is a nation that was so given over to God and God's inheritance that he was going to bless in such a mighty way is now so small that it's ready for destruction. Now, I don't know about you, but that to me is sad to see something so mighty come to a place of extinction. So when we look at our own nation, be careful with the sin we live in. Because if it can happen to Israel, God's inheritance, it sure can happen to us. So be very careful of how we live our lives. I love, though, Amos, the way he stands here. Amos now is, is a true prophet for his people because he's speaking for the people to God. And by this, when the church is so weak and helpless, the same as these people, there better be people standing up and taking control of that situation. In this case, it was the prophet Amos speaking for the people. If we don't have pastors praying for God's people, then we're in trouble. We're in trouble. We have to come to that place. Why? Because prayer changes things. If we don't see that in the Scripture, we're really missing something. We have to understand how much prayer can change. Now, God just pronounced judgment on the nation of Israel. But here's a man, one man, that stood up and went to God in prayer and said, God, you can't do that. You will wipe out your inheritance. You'll wipe out your people. Amos stood up, and he was coming to that place. How great is the power of prayer? Now, this is what we have to see. Note verse 6. Jehovah repented concerning this. This also shall not be, saith the Lord Jehovah. Oh, don't tell me prayer don't work. Because now God changed over one man's prayer. Now, we got to understand this. Can, did God change his mind right here? And the answer to that is no. God did not change his mind. And when we look at repent, that's what we see. That's what we think in that terms. But in this situation, that's not the case. He simply changed the way he was going to work. He changed the way he was going to work. Because what we see here is an amazing thing. God now is going to deal with mercy and not judgment. He's going to deal with mercy. Oh, this is good. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that's good to me. Because now it's left in my hands. It's left in my hands now. How am I going to line up to that? How am I going to line up when God drops that on my life? It's up to me how I work and how I move because his original plan was no questions asked, annihilate him, just like he was going to do when they was in the wilderness, when Moses stood up and said, no, 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 we can't do that. God repented then as well. But when we look at this thing, we have to realize verse 7. Now watch what he does here. Thus he showed me, and behold, the Lord stood beside a wall made by a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. This is good. This is good. Because what we see here now is things begin to change. God's saying, if you're right, then I'll hang the line against you. And if you're crooked, I'll knock you down. Judgment fell into us. How am I going to live my life? It's up to me. So when I hear these guys say, oh, God would never send somebody to hell. Yes, he would, because you sent yourself. Yes. You sent yourself because you did not line up with the plumb line. You have to line up in obedience to what God desires out of your life. And when we can see this, it makes all the difference in the world. It stands or falls by the obedience I have to that line. And that line is Christ. And we'll get to that more in a minute. But when we look at that and we begin to see it, it's everything stands or falls by that standard. God is perfect, and he judges in perfection. That's what he wants. God does not play games with the relationship that we are to have with him. And sadly, this is what many people think. Oh, God's not going to send me to hell. Well, yes, he will, because you send yourself. 
You send yourself, and he proves it right here. So the burden goes off of him, and it comes on to us. And this is what many, so many miss. What happens in all this? Now, note verse 8. And Jehovah said unto me, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a plumb line. Then he said, Lord, behold, I will set a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them anymore. Powerful judgment. Powerful judgment that we see right here. God gives them their chance. He's saying, Amos, if you think they're so right, let's find out. Let's find out. I won't condemn them. But you will by this line. That's incredible to me. That's incredible to me. He repented of how he was going to judge. He now offered mercy. Man, this is the same thing that he carries all the way through the New Testament. He deals in mercy. I know I'm a sinner. I know that. I see that every day when the, I fight the flesh. I see that every day when I get mad at something and then I repent and think, oh, God, what did I do? What did I do? I shouldn't have acted like that. That's not, a, not how a Christian acts. And I repent of that. I've said this many times. I'm a lot better than I used to be, but, boy, I can still go off in a heartbeat. And then I have to feel bad and call them back and apologize. I had to do that to the AT&T lady last week. Man, you, you used to talk about the, the um, uh, motor vehicle. That's nothing to a cell phone place anymore. It's the same thing. You wait and wait and wait and wait, and then they don't give you no answers and say they can't do nothing for you. <laughs> yeah. Then you go off. Then you got to call them back. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should not have acted like that, and I apologize to you. That's humbling. I don't like to do that, so you might as well not get in that position to begin with. But yet the flesh fights us, and the flesh keeps us from that. I wrote this, but I can't remember anything I write, so I put it up here for us. A plumb line cannot make a crooked wall straight. Can't do it. It cannot do it. It can only review the flaw within the wall. That's what it tells me. We had a house in Cratersville, and it had a full basement. And uh, on the west wall, I kept watching it, and I knew it when we bought it. But I thought, eh, it's probably nothing. It's an older house, just normal settling. And every year, I'd look at that thing, and I thought, man, that thing looks like it's bowing a little more. So I dropped the plumb line, and I measured where I set my plumb line, and I marked it, put me a mark there and a nail where I could hang it. And then every year, I'd go measure that wall just to see how much more it's moved, see how much more out of plumb that thing really is. It's amazing how much it moves. If not repaired, then it collapses. And that's our life, and that's the way it works. But know what else it says. God's plumb line, his word, is what is used to enlighten every person to where they fall short of the purity of his righteousness. That's what we guard. We guard our righteousness by his word. I got time, so I'm going to track here. This is where what I was talking about earlier that I've really been seeking and asking God for wisdom in is that word, word. It starts in the book of John, which carries off from Genesis 1, and you get back into Hebrews 1, you see it again. And I come on to this all because of Hebrews 1, which I was wanting to do a message on, and, and it just got going down deeper and deeper and deeper, and I couldn't go there until I went here. Because you got to know this before you understand that. So I got into the Trinity in that word. So next week I'm going to dive into this. But that word means everything. That word is the second part of the Trinity. It's Jesus. We know that from John 1. God's plumb line is Jesus. It is what is used to enlighten every person where they fall short. He is my plumb line. He is the plumb line that I guard myself against. I guide that. I watch it. I measure it. Just like I measured that wall, I measure my life by him every single day because I stand or fall by that. I stand or fall by that. God gave these people a choice. He gave them a choice. 
and it was up to them to stand. If they did not line up, he would no longer pass by. Oh, this is amazing. Now get this. Don't miss this. We know that the Scriptures teach us that there's two deaths. If you're outside of Christ, there will be two deaths that you will suffer. The first death you're going to suffer is physical death. We're all going to face that first death, whether in Christ or not in Christ. If the rapture don't take place, we are all going to face that first death, just like Sister Nellie here. She's in heaven. Her race is over. She's finished her course. Her fight's done. But we go on. We go on. And our fight continues. Why? Because we have not suffered that first death. We have to in order to get to heaven. It's kind of like that old guy said, you all want to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. You know, a lot of truth to that. But the thing we have to realize is, is that second death. The second death goes with this. Because what it does is tell me that second death is total separation from God. That's what it is. The second death is separation from the Father. That's what makes the difference. That's where it's telling me that when Amos speaks of this, that's what it's meaning. We will be out of God's sight. That's the second death. Death is separation. And when I suffer that second death because I'm not in Christ and the judgments fell and I'm way over here from where I need to be, then God will not pass by you no more. He will not pass by. And because of that, we suffer that separation. We suffer, uh, we suffer not being in his presence. And that's where we fall. That's where we falter. It is not tended to. If our life is not tended to, we will fall. And we will be judged. And to me, this is where it's torn down. And this is where life is annihilated. God stands at the wall. And he looks and seeks perfection in our walls, our lives. But we have to ask the question, what is he seeking? This is what we must look at. Notice this verse in John 4, verse 23. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such does the Father seek to be his worshipers. I love that verse. I love that verse. It's so powerful because we see God's heart. God desires us to be true. Now, we got to get back to the building the builder again. In order to understand that verse, we have to understand what that means. If something is true, it's a builder's term. If we say that's true, that means it's perfect. It's right on the mark. Nothing's moving. Nothing's, nothing's out of whack. It's straight. It's plumb. It's, it's level. Everything's right where it needs to be. That's what it's speaking of. He wants us perfect in our worship. He wants those that have a perfect in heart, this builder's term. Now, watch what this means. To be true, it means to be conformable to an existing standard or pattern, a condition of being exact or accurate as out of true. This is something that's key in our life. We have to come to a place to be plumb is perfection. It's perfectly vertical. Get it? It's perfectly vertical. So my life is perfectly to heaven. It's perfectly lined up with Jesus. I'm perfect with the Father because he's seeking somebody that's true. He wants my worship pure, not to come in and just sing songs. If we're just singing songs, it's no good. It's worthless. It's just something to get through to get to something else. But if we come with true worship, it's that seeking of the Father and thinking, oh, God, I do this for your glory, honoring him blessing him, bringing glory to his name. That's what we should be doing. That's what God's seeking. I want to give you a few things the Bible tells us to be true in, to be perfect, to be in a condition that's exact, to be accurate. I'm only going to show you two because I figured I'd run way out of time, and by the time I get through these, I probably will be. But note the first one. He says we need a true heart. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, perfect heart in fullness of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience and having our body washed with pure water. Ah, we come with a purity. Our heart must conform. It must be exact in everything that we do. Exact to him. Exact 
to that standard, not something that we're wishy-washy with in our faith, not a, a fence sitter who one minute is walking with Christ and the next minute living in the world to, to, doesn't mean nothing because I'm in this crowd. And when I get back over to this crowd, I will get back over here. No, you serve God and you do exact. I do the same here as I do here as I do here because I bring honor to his name when I walk in that type of perfection. I must come to that place in my life because when we come to Christ, we've came to a place where we've had the ultimate heart transplant. My life has now changed. I'm different. I'm new. I've been made new. Why? Because God wants me to line up with his perfection, and the only way I can do that is walking with Christ, making him the one that I set the standard by. That to me is an incredible thing because everything then lines up with him. I don't look at Bud and say, hey, I need to be like Bud. No, because Bud's just, Bud's just as flawed as I am. I line myself up with Jesus. I read his word. I see how he acted. Why? Because he was God incarnate, and I follow him. And I'll bring that out more next week, so I'm not going to park there. But the second thing we see is this. We see true holiness. We see true holiness. Ephesians 4.24 and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and what? True holiness. Perfect holiness. We have to come to that place. God desires purity. He desires purity. And our purity must be true. We must come to that place. Many think that they are okay. Now get this. Many think that we're okay. But if we're okay, what are we judging our okay to? Now, come on. Uh, you got to answer this question in your own life. If I'm okay, what am I okay to? Am I okay to self? Am I judging myself? Because I'm telling you right now, if you judge by yourself, your level could be off. It could be dropped. And if it's dropped, it only takes one degree. When I was working, I, I run a brake press, and I had to do a lot of angles and, and all kinds of stuff. But when I would bend something, depending on how big that piece was, if I was only bending a piece this big and I was off three degrees, didn't make a hill of beans. But if that piece was six feet long and I was off three degrees, that's massive because it can make an inch difference from this end to that end. Life's long. It's, it's, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. If my life is only off a few degrees from plum. By the time I get to the end of my life, Jesus is here, and I continue on that grade, I can be miles away from him, miles away from him. And I must stand true to his word, making him the standard. We have to gauge our own wall. I can't do that for you, and you can't do it for me. Know what John tells us here, John 5, 31 and 32. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. It is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true, perfect. So what's he saying? Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit will witness, and his witness is true. So when the Holy Spirit works in my life, and I'm following the word, I know it's true. It's perfect. Because this is the way God made it, and it's the way God created it. So this is something that gives me an encouragement. Because if we are not allowing Jesus to be into that place, we're never going to make it. We're never going to come to that place. Because he gave us the gauge, and we must gauge to him. He's everything that's calibrated to that. Our lines can be obstructed by the littlest of things. We was on a job one time, and I dropped a plumb bob because we had to put some holes in the wall to drive some, get some pipe through. And we dropped the line down, and I told the kid working with me, man, there's something wrong. I said, we, we need to be way over there, not here. And we got to looking, and where we dropped our plumb bob, there was a piece right at the top of concrete stuck out of the block that moved it like this. And by the time it got to the bottom, it moved it quite a bit. So we was off a lot. The least little wind 
will blow that thing. You talk about something frustrating. You got a plumb bob down there, and you got to drill a hole through the floor to get your pipe in, and you're trying to get that little thing to stop. You're 10 feet up there, and it's swinging like this. The stupid wind keeps blowing it. It won't stop. You're trying to hold it and let it go real quick to see if it stays. Just a little bit of wind blows it off. It's not perfect. We have to guard everything in our life. God drops the line. God drops the line, and he is the one that matters. Now watch this verse, Isaiah 28, 17. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plummet. And the hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies, and the water shall overflow the hiding place. Ah, oh, powerful verse. But nobody says, I will make justice the line and the righteousness the plummet. Get it? Righteousness. And the bottom is, right, uh, is righteousness. The line is justice. What a joy we have to know that God's judgments are true. They're right. And we have nothing to fear. Ask yourself this question. If God dropped the line on your life today, what would it show? Would it be perfect? Or would it be off? Would you hear them words, let it stand? Or would you hear the words, tear it down? Block walls are an amazing thing to me. I was sitting there one day at work. We was working at a plaza someplace. They was building it, and I think I was by myself. So I went out to eat my lunch in my truck, and I'm sitting there watching in my mirror for some stupid reason. I was just looking out my mirror when I got a full windshield there, but I'm looking in my mirror. Don't know why. Windy. Man, it was windy that day. Trucks are rocking, just sitting there eating my lunch. And I looked in the mirror, and all of a sudden, I thought I was seeing things, and I couldn't believe it. These bricklayers had a whole wall built. Now, why they did this, I don't know. They never put no bracing on it. Dumb to do that because they had nothing to hold that wall. I mean, this wall was probably 15 feet high, 50 feet long. I mean, it was a monstrous wall. And I'm sitting there looking in the mirror, and all of a sudden, this thing goes like this. I thought, ah, oh, I had to see that wrong. And all of a sudden, I hear a whoop. That whole wall just fell. I thought, man, how many Christians live their life every day knowing that that wall is coming down, and that's how fast it will happen? That's how fast it'll happen. Scary. It's scary. Many times we think we got all kinds of time. Got all kinds of time. But look how fast things can change. Things can change. The snap of a finger, blink of an eye. Our lives need to be right, and they need to be right all the time. Because I'm telling you, when the judgment comes, and the wall comes down. There's no stopping it. You see a wall like the one I just mentioned begin to fall? You just try your best to get out of the way and hope you're not under it when it hits. Because you are not going to make it out of that. You no way would live through that. But it's sad that every day so many Christians live their life in the same way. This is where a Christian must be careful, though. We got to be careful. Because by that statement right there, it's not up to me to judge your life. I get upset with pastors that stand up here and try to tell you what to do. I didn't tell you what to do. That ain't my job. I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. The conviction comes through the Holy Spirit. If you're living in sin, I'm going to tell you. I'll point it out to you. But I'm not going to judge you for it. That's not my job. That's that line's job. That's God's job, not mine. It's my job to help you, not judge you. F.B. Myers was a pastor of years gone by, but he made this statement, and I thought this was excellent. That's what he says. When we see a brother or a sister in sin, there are two things we do not know. First is this. We do not know how hard or he or she tried not to sin. And second, we do not know the power, the forces that assailed him or her. We also do not know what we would have done in those same circumstances. Oh, that's good. That is good. We are so quick to judge. We are so quick to judge. But it's not up to me to judge. And I will not. It's up to me to encourage you. I can't do this. Because if I do this, I do that. I'm off just a little bit. 
But if God does the judging, it's right on. It's true. It's true in word. It's true in perfection. It's up to me to allow Christ to work in my life and allow me to line up with him and allow the Holy Spirit to give me the encouragement to get to that place. I encourage you. As we go into these next services, I, don't, I hate to build something up too much because you could fall on your flat in your face and not go over well as you hope it will. But what I do believe is this. I believe that what we'll learn next week is something you probably never heard before because I never had. So I pray that you would come with a prayed up heart and be ready to hear what God's word says. That's, that's the key. But we have to come to a place where we let our heart be pure before God. Amen. He is the one that we need to please. And we please him by walking in Christ, lining up with him and taking this word and allow it to be the guide. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Father, for your mercy as we see here. Father, what a blessing it is to know that judgment is by you. Father, the, that that judgment is by Jesus, and it lines up to him. So I pray, Father, that you would allow us to open our eyes to see that. Father, we are all sinners, but hopefully we are saved by grace. And if we are not, then I pray, Father, that you would just touch in a mighty way, that your Holy Spirit would convict each heart in life, that we would come to a place where we would put you first and allow you to drop that line into our life. Father, if we need conviction, I pray that it would fall. Father, if we need encouragement, I pray that you'd give it. But, Father, most of all, let us work together as a body that we might build each other into that place encouraging to go a little bit further. Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy. And Father, for the love of the Lord Jesus to come to this earth, to die on that cross, that I might have life, that he could fulfill your will. Father, we praise you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.